Hello from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This time, we are going to take two episodes to delve into the world of poker. You've probably seen a multitude of layouts from Western movies to ESPN and the World Series of Poker, but we are going to just go into the basic steps of how to play some of the terminology and also hand rankings and how they can be so important and why this group over here with four clubs out of five that upside down card might be very interesting depending on what it is. Let's get stuck in. As usual, whenever I do a card game, I like going over the cards themselves. Previously on this series, we've used German style decks or Italian style decks or even Japanese decks. See the episode on Han Fudo where we talk about that. But we're using a French style deck, probably the one that you're most common to seeing in the West and typically in the United States. So I'm gonna go over these cards because they do have an actual rank to them that is gonna be important for some of these games. So we have in a certain order, the ace. Now in a lot of games, we have the ace being either the one, so an ace low game, or the ace being above the king, an ace high game. For all of these poker games that we're gonna be talking about today, they're all ace high game. So we're gonna consider them over here. So our lowest card's gonna be a two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. These are what are called pip cards because they have pips representing in each suit what they are. I'll get to suits in a moment. But then we have what are our court cards, which are going to be slightly above. Our jack, our queen, our king, and then our ace will be the last court card. So there is actually a ranking to these suits. It actually goes in alphabetical order, or technically, if we're being semantic here, reverse alphabetical order as to the hierarchy of the suits. So important to note here that our clubs are our lowest ranking suit, our diamonds are second, hearts are third, and spades at the end of the alphabet is technically our highest ranking suit, which is why you probably hear people talk about the ace of spades as being a, the most important card, or a royal flush, which we will get to in a moment when I talk about hand rankings, almost always looking like a suit of spades. So when I talk about hand rankings, what do I mean? I mean that in a game, we are going to see rank be the important element here in determining who wins versus who loses. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear this up real quick. And as per also usual, when I'm on this series, I want to talk about shuffling. Now I do have another deck handy here. So let me get this all cleaned up. Shuffling is going to be intensely important or else this game isn't very random now, is it? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut the deck, split it into roughly half. You can technically do it other ways, but you're gonna hold it into two segments and you're gonna take your thumbs right here and you're gonna just hold it diagonally and let the cards slowly go through and see how they've got a little blend here. And you'll just repeat that process. This is one of the most common ways to do it. And just from an accessibility standpoint, because I know this can be hard for some people, you can also in your hand, just take a couple cards, flip them up and just do this. 
and you take a little bit from like the top and the bottom and this can help you shuffle and get a bit more random. Some of the cards may try and fall out, but that's okay. You can also just from making it even simpler for somebody who may not have it, you can do what's called washing these cards and just kind of move them around effectively. Eventually they will wash and meld and then you can bring it all together in the end. But as long as you are shuffling, this is going to be the key part. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you for all of these games, we're going to start with five cards. Uh, I will be showing you a seven card version of this, which gives you a little bit more probability. We'll get to that in a minute. But I need to talk about the ranks of the hands themselves. So I'll actually take the shuffle bit. I'll reshuffle before we start. So there's 10 ranks that we got to deal with here. Our first one is called high card. Nothing matches, suits, pairs, nothing's in order. Everything is just strewn about. So let's show you an example of that. Now, of course, this would be something else. We're going to hold this off for a second. So here, this is just called Ace High. So if you had this in your hand, either through a community card or through just what's in your hand, you would be able to say you have the lowest rank of card. Uh, this happens for actually roughly about half the time. It's harder to get in a set of 52, a pair or some sort of matching. Usually it happens, but sometimes this is the best you can manage. Sometimes you even have something like, this would be queen high, because your highest card available is a queen. So this is where the rank from ace on down determines what you have. So that's the bottom. Next, we're gonna have what's called the one pair. This is sort of rank number nine. So you have in a set of five, two cards which match. Because we're only dealing with one deck here, this is what's going to show up. Um, in games where you have larger number of players, you can see poker tables have nine, ten players. They'll obviously be using more decks, but we're just going to be using one deck. We're only going to have four players represented here. So this would be just one pair. Our next in the rank, we're going to take this nine out for now, is two pair, which is not bad. So out of five cards, you have four cards which match each other. This would beat one pair. This would also beat the high card style hand. So when you have two pair, this is a little more rare. Um, it happens roughly about 20% of the time. So you've got a bit better probability of winning the hand. These hands become increasingly more complex and because of this increasingly rare because it requires specific outcomes to occur. So that is our eighth ranked hand. Now let's switch this out. I'm going to take out this queen for a moment. You'll see why a little bit later. Let's dig if you don't mind. Our next one is going to be a three of a kind. So it's three threes. This is our seventh ranked hand. It happens, notice how much more complex this is that you have to have three out of the available four in a 52 card hand. Pretty rare. Any combination, there's over two million combinations of different hands you could have. This doesn't show up too often, especially when we're dealing with what's supposed to be random chance. So we've got high card, we've got one pair, we've got two pair, we've got three of a kind. Notice the sort of complexity level that's involved here. So next, this is going to actually require a little bit of digging here, but we're going to have three. We've already got, there's a four. I'm looking for very specific cards here. There's a five. And there is a six. So this is once again a combination of five cards that's not as easy to get. As a matter of fact, it's a little harder because you have to have all five of these in a row. This is called a straight. This is our rank six. So we've got high card, we've got one pair, we've got two pair, we've got three of a kind. So notice how you need 
all five cards, nothing has to match. Cool. That's pretty common or at least plausible and likely to happen. One pair is relatively likely because you need eight of 52 potential combinations to kind of match up. Three of a kind, you need three of the cards to match up with your probability. Now you need five in a row. And notice these are all almost of different suits. We have a diamond, a heart, two clubs, and a spade. So this is our sixth ranked hand. Now let's go back to clubs here. I'm gonna switch it out and give us our next combination. Notice this is not in a row, but it is five cards that you have. So remember there are only 13 cards out of 52 that are matching this club. So this is another level of rarity. This is what's called a flush. So if you've heard the slang term of being flush with cash, it's kind of a variant upon this because this is a pretty low probability hand. Once you've gotten to this level, you've got a rather, air quotes, rare hand. Here, all they have to be is of the same suit, does not have to be in an order. Next in our level of complexity, I'm gonna bring back our triplicate of threes that we had earlier, because now we're getting into the rare territory. This is, uh, if you've ever played a dice game like Yahtzee, you're probably familiar with this term. It's what's called a full house. Now you need a combination of threes, which was already kind of rare, and you need another pair on top of it. It does not matter which. And I'm sure you're thinking, okay, well, cool. What if two people have a full house? How would you actually manage that? Tie breaking is gonna be kind of an important part here because as we get to these increased levels, the odds are that in a table of four, more than one person's gonna have a pair. Well, once again, you're dealing with the high card. Why did I pull out this queen? Well, it determines the ranking. So a triplicate of threes as a full house and a pair of queens is less ranked than a triplicate of queens and a pair of threes because it is a full house full of queens versus a full house full of threes. This is already a, I think it's like 97th, 98th percentile of hand to have a full house. You see it happen relatively often as you play, but it is a particularly high ranking hand that if you have a full house, we're already up to the fourth rank you're having increasing complexity. So if you manage to have this, especially from the start, you have a really good hand. It's hard to lose it, but there are exceptions. So our third ranked hand is, I have to actually now dig to find this because we need all four, four of a kind. Think of how rare this is. Four people are getting 52 card potential combinations. And if we're playing a game like five card stud, that means that only 20 of these cards are being dealt. Over half the deck is not being used for this particular hand. So getting all four of these threes is going to beat that full house because instead of a combination that has a fairly decent level of probability compared, this requires you to get really good luck. It is entirely possible. So that is four of a kind. So we've got, again, high card, pair, two pair, three of a kind, a straight, a flush, a full house, and a four of a kind. So now here's where we get into low probability. But guess what? We're going to make it work this time just for the sake of things. But this also means, notice how as we get more complex, I have to dig to find these. And there's our two. Which should belie how complex it is to get this combination. But if you're looking out for it, you know what to look for. You know kind of when you get these initial cards, what your hand is going to look like. So this is what's called a straight flush. So you have a combination of a straight, three, four, five, six, seven, could be any combination of five. By the way, 
Ace is always high, it does not wrap around, just for comparison points, because in some games it does. But this is a straight that happens in the same suit. So remember how a straight itself was the sixth rank and a flush was the fifth rank. If you have a combination of this, this is evolved into the second rank of hands. But there's one, there's one that beats them all. And notice once again, I have to really dig to find this one. It is what's called the Royal Flush. Why is it called the Royal Flush? Well, as you can see here, it is a combination of being a straight. It is a combination of being a flush. And it is all of the court cards. In a four player game, the probability of you getting this is stupendously low. So if we had one person with this as a five card grouping and one person with this as a five card grouping, notice how even, even if you had, let me find another 10 here. Even if you had the 10 of spades here, because of the rarity of finding the 10 of clubs, this would be an excellent straight, but it's not a flush. It's not a straight flush. That is why we deal with the probability of hands being such an important part of this game. So, once again, in order, our high card, nothing matches. One pair, any two cards match. Two pair, two sets of any two cards matching. Three of a kind, three cards matching, doesn't have to be the same suit. Straight does not have to match suits, but it has to be one, two, three, four, five. Well, we can't have ace be one, but two, three, four, five, six, or four, five, six, seven, eight. Then the flush, any cards that are just of the same suit, a full house, a triplet, and a pair. The triplet is what is sort of like a tiebreaker. Four of a kind, all four of one card. A straight flush, which is a combination of that two, three, four, five, six, and in the same suit. And then the royal flush, which you see here, which is the five highest ranking cards all of the same suit. This is one of those things that you can kind of keep track of as you go along. And kind of learning this game as you play, you will find that you kind of know from the get-go based on what you have. Let's say, let's do a quick sampler here real quick and i am just going to deal two cards we're going to do it face up just to kind of highlight the basic concept because more often than not you're going to be able to rule out that you're not going to have a royal flush pretty quick you're going to rule out a straight flush pretty quick and you have to think of what's the highest ranked hand i could have so this per ace nine so what i want you to do is as you look through see what the possible hands are that are available. So this ace and four, it's not a pair, but it is a possible flush. You have two of the five hearts you would need for a flush. Not bad. You also have an ace high. If you get dealt or we're dealing with a community card where one gets played, where you have an ace and one gets played, oh look, you have a pair. There's no possibility of a royal flush, sorry. There's no possibility of a straight flush. Four of a kind is implausible, but I guess possible. Full house is rare, but possible. So really a flush is your best possible hand with these two cards. With here, a straight is the best possible combination. You've got a nine and a 10. So you need the three cards surrounding it. Jack six. Not great, but you do have at least a jack. Something. 10-6 is technically even lower ranked than this, but it has a chance of connecting because if you got the 7, the 8, and the 9, you do have a possible straight. So everything, I know this is potentially a lot at the start, but you actually reduce greatly what your probability of hands are based on what you have in your hand and what you're initially dealt. And then you can worry about probability and what you would need in order to complete that hand. So, in a nutshell, 
That is the ranking itself. I wanted to kind of go through piece by piece and show you the examples of how they look and how they would be implemented in a game. But now, we have to get into, it's more than just winning a hand. It's how you win the hand that matters. One second. So the history of this entire family of games goes way back. But we have to talk about, I'm going to go ahead and skip the development of cards, but go to Persia in the 17th century with a very particular type of deck and a game called Asnas, played with only 20 cards. So I'll use the court cards that we have in our French deck as an example, but they had the king, they had the lady, they had the soldier, they had what was essentially another court card called the musician, and everybody's favorite, the ace. Now, this game was played in just a simple hierarchy tier. You were looking for a full house, so a triplet of something and a duplicate of something, sets, a complete set here, two pairs of something, so two kings, two queens, two aces, two musicians, etc., or just one pair. And that was a quick hand ranking hierarchy of this game. And it had very particular betting rules. So the betting rules were uh, referenced with variants upon didam, or I have seen, which was part of the betting. You also had a way of folding, which is basically I have not seen. But then you had the way of betting without looking at your cards, which you would actually say, without seeing, I have seen, which I think is a really cool phrasing of language to make it work. But Asnas is the first documented game that we have involving this style of hand ranking. So now that we have gone over the French suit and the hand ranks, I'm going to go through this step by step. We're going to do a couple of basically what I'm going to call sample games. And I'm going to teach just generally the concept of how you win this game. So notice that I have a lot of these little chips here and tokens. Now, what I'm going to say is that this is intended for fun. This is just a token representation of denominations. So we have here. Uh, whoop. I've got ones, I've got fives, I've got 25s, 50s, 100s, 500s, and thousands. And notice that I've given a pretty even distribution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to incre increasingly use the amount that we are exchanging. So notice how everybody has the same amount to start this will change. Uh, just so I can show you, especially over the course of two episodes, I'm just going to keep the imbalance growing. But I'm also going to increase the stakes or the blinds as it will be called later. Um, but I'm first going to talk about the ante. So the ante here is, and this is A-N-T-E, not, not your aunt, you are going to have to put in a certain amount. Um, you hear people use the terminology of you have to pay to play. Well, we're going to start off with just one for being the ante. So the game we'll be playing here is called Stud Poker. And we're going to be doing five cards. Five card stud is its game. Uh, and its reason for being called stud actually relates to the American West, where stud would refer in this particular to a horse. So you're thinking of the stud horse, the highest hand. This is where hand rankings becomes really important. But what we're going to do is we're going to just have our ante here. And each player is going to get one card down. And then one card up. So keep hand ranks in mind. And this is where having a game with a low visibility still gives you a little bit of information to go off of. So for example, let's say that you have this four of spades. 
Well, you know that it is now impossible to get a straight flush in any direction. Same for the five. It's impossible because the four and the eight are here that you would all requisitely need. The eight would need the nine, 10, jack, queen in order to complete that straight, let alone a straight flush. So there's no royal flush here. That's already been rolled out, cool. Straight flush, low probability for here, low probability for here. Four of a kind, there's no pairs visible, so cool. Uh, full house, nothing visible still. Flush is increasingly unlikely because three of the 13 cards of the spades are already out. Um, straight, same problem as the straight flush. Three of a kind, we don't know. Two pair, we don't know. Pair, we don't know. High card, technically the eight is the one that's leading right now. So no core cards. So now we're gonna go ahead and look at what the second card is. For the purposes of this, normally this card would stay down, but we are going to show the visibility of it here, but we're gonna pretend that this is the only person that can see it. So there's a 10, Again, yeah, just like hold this token over. So Royal Flush is definitely out. Straight Flush is out. Four of a Kind is out. Full House, very low probability. Flush is out. Straight is out. Same problem as before. Three of a Kind, low. Two pair, low, pair, low. High card, your high card's a 10. Now let's kind of do this again. Royal Flush out. Straight Flush out. Four of a Kind out unless you get all of the cards in sequence. So it's very, very improbable, but possible. The flush is now out. Uh, the straight is out. Three of a kind, low. Two pair, possible. Pair, possible. High card is jack. So notice how it kind of keeps on going. All right, one card that actually benefits somebody. Uh, a straight, possible. So if you had the 10, the seven, and the six, that would be a straight, but you don't know that a 10 is out. So, okay, it's not terrible hand. Now our last one is that 10. So, we know from our side that a 10 is, four of a kind is now out for this player. Um, they have high card, so not that great a deal for our first hand example here, but we're gonna take this in steps. So now that everyone's anteed, uh, you have three options. Well, technically four, but we'll stick with generally three. You can fold. You can say, I'm out. You know, I'm leaving this hand. There's nothing good for me here. There's nothing great here, but eh, we're working with it. You can do what's called check, uh, done by knocking. More on that importance in a minute. Or you can bet. So what happens here is how do you determine who goes first? In a lot of games, it's typically the person to the left of the dealer. But in stud poker, you actually determine by who has the high card. Remember that the 10, the jack, the nine, and the 10 are upside down. So technically, the highest card is this eight of spades. So they get to go first. They say, I'm gonna check. This person says, okay, I'm gonna check. This person says, okay, I'm gonna check. This person says, ah, I'm gonna check. If this person bet, all of a sudden, it is on this person to act. You have to reach equity before anything can proceed. So you can't have any sort of imbalance. So if someone decides to bet five, and in stud poker, usually there is an anti-limit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm only gonna operate in sets of two. So we're gonna do dealing where eventually everyone will have five cards. So there are three more cards that are gonna be dealt to each player. So there's three more rounds kind of situated. So everybody checks here and says, okay, cool, fine. So now, we're gonna do what's called burning a card. So this card's gonna be taken out and it will no longer be used. We'll take a look at what that is later. This person gets the first card. Three, 
possible. So now I want to treat it as though these cards are upside down again. So the eight and the three are the only thing you can see. So on our side, we thought, okay, cool. That's the other three that they needed that. So, well, we're in some trouble here. But the other players can think, okay, if that card's also a spade, they have three of the cards needed. This is where that ambiguity really comes into play. This person has a pair. This person has a pair. And this person has really not much going for it. So we know from our side that there's a pair involved. Excellent. That's something. I'll take it. This person has an open pair. Now, since we don't know what this 10 is, we think, okay, there's a possibility that I could get a four of a kind still or a three of a kind. We know that's very unlikely, but they have an open pair. So instead of having this person be the first to act, the person with the highest hand that is visible is going to act next. This person has a pair. So they say, cool, I'm going to bet two. So they now have a total of three on the board. This means that all players must match this three or leave it in order to proceed on. This person says, okay, I've got a pair. It's manageable. They're gonna bet two. This person says, mm, I don't really have anything and I don't think I'm gonna get anything in these next two cards that will help. It's relatively low unless you've got another five or another jack, who knows? So they're gonna do what's called fold. So this ante is gonna be lost, but it also means they don't lose any more. So this is gonna be our folded area over here. We're gonna just put this face down. So this person's now out. This person says, oh, I've got real, really unlikely, but I'll stay, because why not? This is our first of many bad decisions as a player. I am not good at this game. I just know how to play it. Uh, but that is part of the fun here where you're supposed to have a loose and relaxed time with it. It's not supposed to be serious. So everything has reached equity. Now I'm going to, like I said before, burn another card. These burn cards could be really important in the end. Two, this person now has a possible flush from what we can see. This person has really nothing but that two it's interesting. And that king is like, hmm, they don't really have anything. So once again, we go by what is the highest ranking hand that's visible. Uh, the possible flush does not outrank the fact that there's a pair on the field. So this person gets to go again. They think, you know what? I'll check. This person says, I got a pair of tens. Possible flush, but they also know that they cannot get a flush. But what you can do, part of this game is bluffing. So if you think, I can say I want to bet because I want people to think that I have a flush. That is part of this game is some element of deception. This person over here thinks I've got nothing. So I'm gonna just go ahead and fold. That makes this pot four. These cards come out of play. And then this person has to think, what do I want to do? They're gonna say, you know what, we're gonna keep going. They're gonna keep going. Even if that's not necessarily the air quotes best decision, they have a pair, they have something. There's the possibility they could get that seven that they need or get a another king or another 10 that they might need. So we're gonna, once again, burn this last card. Seven, that's that seven they needed. A king. That is what they needed. So now, once again, this person is, mm, I can't convince people I have a flush anymore because I definitely don't have one. Uh, and let's now look at the hands. I'm gonna put them in relative order here. So this person has one pair, and then this is the one that's blank. So it would look like this. This person has two pair that are openly visible. There's a possibility of a full house. So they think, okay, in the last segments, you can actually bet up to four. 
This person bets four. So they have a total of one, two, three, four. They have a total of nine here. That's on the field. And this person only has five. So they want to potentially lose five or lose nine. What they're going to do is play smart and they're going to fold. You don't have to show what this card is, by the way. So this player now all of a sudden gets all of this pot. They have won the hand. Now let's see and look what these burn cards are. Six and two twos. That could have been helpful to over here. Uh, that wasn't going to be helpful here. That wasn't really going to be helpful here. So this is the only player that could have benefited from it. But these burn cards you don't see. This person at least knows that they had the highest hand. They don't have to show that. Some people do, but it is traditionally considered bad form. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to reset. And then I'll just give a little bit more context as to this game. And I'm going to increase the stakes just a little bit here for fun. One second. So the next step I want to take on the development of poker-based games is actually, we're going to do kind of a sidestep. And I'm going to talk about the game Lance Canet, which I previously covered on banking games. It was a dealer-based game, much like how I have it here. And it involved turning up cards and matching their value. Do you see maybe a potential connection coming for this style of game? So poker itself is a development of both the Asnas that I referred to before, as well as some games coming very, very soon. So now I then have to cover the further development of the game back on the poker wording. Where did that come from? And why did it involve either bragging or knocking? One second, I'll explain. So, welcome back. What I went ahead and did was I went ahead and exchanged out some chips. Notice that I have a limited selection here. So, in the interest of trying to keep everything organized and together, I'm just going to progressively make change, especially as we increase the ante that's required. So, for this next one, I'm going to require uh, five, just as the minimum. And then we can do in multiples of five. So that way I can get these ones progressively stacked. So uh, we're going to have, see, that's five right there. That's whoop, one too many. Five right there. And everybody has to participate in order to keep playing. Now, what I'm going to do for the purposes of showing you all, I'm not going to be giving you everybody's hand this time. This one is going to stay private. You'll find out why later. But I'm going to go ahead and show you which these cards, so that way you can get kind of an understanding as to what the mystery element is. And I'll just progressively make this a little more fun to keep track of. So we once again, the highest ranked card goes first. That would be this Jack. Uh, notice that any match, we're going to go by that hierarchy of hands. So if any of these uh, cards had been an exact match, we'll go in order. So that club, because it is lowest on the alphabet, would go last in the event of a tie. But we don't see any other matched or any other higher card. So we've got something. So we've got a five that you can see. You've got jack and an eight. So you've got possible straight, unlikely. Eight and nine, you've got two in a row, cool. But not in suits, possible straight. And this possible flush. And possible straight, possible straight flush, if your cards end up being right. But you don't know what this other card is. So everybody decides to check. We'll keep it going like last time. I'm gonna burn that card. And you've got a king. You've got a four. You've got a four. And you've got a 10. So, flush is out the window. Uh, straight is still possible. You need the eight for sure, and then six or a jack, possible. Uh, your straight's gone. This is not a great hand for you. Um, on your end, you'd think possible flush. No straight involved here, no pairs involved here. And once again, you don't know what's here, but 
you from your end could know, well, that's definitely not a royal flush. That's definitely not a straight flush. Not four of a kind, likely not full house. Not a flush, not a straight. So not bad. So uh, now we're gonna go once again with the highest hand rank, which would be this king high. They think, okay, that's what is here. So we're gonna go in multiples five again. So they're gonna put five on that table. Uh, this person is gonna continue on. They, part of it is sometimes the opportunity for knowing what is potentially seen. Uh, this person's gonna fold because they know they've got nothing. So this five goes in the center. And this person with the possible straight, they won the last hand too. So they feel a bit more comfortable if they lose. All right, everybody is once again in equity. We're gonna burn that card. 10, a king, possible flush. And that eight. Hmm, so what am I gonna do over here? I know that a king's out, so depending on what that bottom card is, to check. Yeah, I think I'll check here. This person, um, depending on what you want people to think this card is, because they now know that you've got a possible flush if that card is a club. We know it's not, but... Um, this person needs one of two potential cards, and none of them have been played yet, aside from that jack. So they need a six or a jack on their last card. Possible. So they say, all right, I'm going to check. This person says, ah, I'm going to check. This person says, you know what? Put five in. Because their payout is potentially pretty good. Now we have here. Since I'm doing the example here, I'm definitely going to join in the fun. And this person. So here's the risk. Right now, we have mystery. We have possible straight, we have possible flush. We know that this is nothing. Could get interesting. So let's find out. Burn. Seven. An eight. And a three. We now know that this person has nothing. Uh, well, correction, they have 10 high. That's not a very high ranking card. Uh, or they have what we would refer to as bupkis. Well, this person definitely doesn't have a flush. They don't have a straight. You don't know what that mystery card is. And this person has a possible flush. They have king high. So they have king high and then the tiebreaker, which is that jack. So they would actually be the one to go first because of that high ranking. Now, what do they want to do? You could actually bet and then raise double the ante because we're at the end. So they're going to put in 10. What do they want people to think they have? Because actually all we in fact have is a pair, a single pair of eights. So we have that ninth tier of play. Person, it, if they had that nine as the revealed card, they could try and convince people they have a straight. But because of that, they're going to go ahead and they lose, what's that, 15 here? Which sucks, but alas, here we are. What's this mystery card? This person says, all right. I'm gonna... It's technically a bad play to do this, but we're going to do this for the example. Because if I was playing in this seat, I would say, mm, that's too high of a risk that that last card is a flush. And if... I don't have anything to match. I'm not gonna be able to bluff them out. Um, I, in theory, I could put down like a 20 and try and really bluff them out to make them think I have something, but the other person says, mm, no. So now we're gonna show down. We've got quite a few pieces in here. Pretty good stakes, all things considered. So the person shows out. What was that mystery card? It was a five. So they had a pair of fives, which means that we're going to go put this together. 
they have a pair of fives. And if they had to happen to match fives, the kicker would be that king, and it would just go on sequentially. Usually what happens on most games, pairs of equal value will just split the pot. But this person will be able to show they have a pair of eights. So that's, let's see what we got here. That's 25, five, 10, that's 15. So that's what, 45? So it's 45, 50, 60, 70. Not bad, right? So that is just off of a simple pair. Remember how I talked about probabilities here? Notice we have not left that second tier really, just with simple pairs. We might have had the sixth tier, but that is where the probability belies out of 2 million hands. So what happens if I uh, add some cards to it? Let's do seven card stud next. One second. So as promised, I want to talk about bragging or knocking, which is the original phraseology of pokin or poch. So it's a debate as to whether the French or the Germans, you'll hear this often with most card games, which started it first. But we're going to use both here because it literally means to knock. And you'll actually see this in modern card games where people will check by knocking on the table. Um, because of the brag or to bluff, that actually led into our sidestep, the English game of literally called brag. It is a copy of a game called Post and Pair, which actually goes back to the 16th century. So it's just a further development. Most games end up crossing over with their development over time. But it, it introduced the concept of hand ranks a little bit more literally. It had the concept of straights or five cards in a row or flushes of having everything of the same suit. So here, for example, I've just dealt some cards out. We almost have a straight. It's just missing this one card. Who knows what that card is? But here is the catch. With Bragg, it was only three cards rather than five. So you see a lot of these games develop in a very particular way over time. So, went ahead and got ourselves reset, went ahead and changed out some pieces. You'll notice the stack on my side is going to keep growing a little bit. Uh, so once again, I'm not going to show you this one. And this time I'm also not going to show you this one. So that way we can have a little bit more mystery added to this one. Also, for funsies, we're going to do seven card stud. So this increases the possibility of you getting the hand that you want. This also increases the mystery because now you're not going to know two of the player's hands. I won't make it where you don't see anybody's hands. Uh, we're always going to make it a little easier. But now I'm going to increase for the purpose of collecting these ones. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Nine. Nine would be the cap. So we're going to make it the equivalency of the ante will be ten. And then after that, we'll make sure these get rid of. So we are going to make two fives, two fives, two fives, and two fives. So everybody has done the equivalency. So like I said, not going to show you these, but I am going to show you these. So we've got a king and a two, and we got a nine and a three. So unlike five card stud, the idea of a flush is still technically open. You need a lot of cards and a lot of help, but you technically do have a little bit of option. Let me relook at this real quick. Okay. Wait. Yeah, okay. And then here. All right. So what I'm going to do is much like last time, I'm going to burn a card. And then bop, bop. A bop and a bop. So I'm just presuming everybody checks. So let me take a look here real quick. Don't don't look. Um, okay. So over here, we don't really have anything together. Um, 
it's not bad. You've got a pair of threes over here. So you got something. Notice how so far through this game, we've had pretty high probabilities of nothing. Well, now you're more than likely to get something, but you've at least got something to roll with. Let's see, what do we got here? Okay. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and do our kind of equivalency of bringing in this personal bet. Five. This personal bet. And we're gonna be spotting some tokens here in a second. Uh, we're gonna make this the equivalency of five. I'm gonna go and change it out here. This person will get five. So this is gonna be treated a teensy bit like bank error in your favor. And this person will get five. So everybody has 15 in. And notice this is pretty common with like changing stuff out. Sometimes you just gotta kinda make it work. Uh, this is why typically some people will have everybody cash in and everyone just has to agree with what they're doing. So we got 15 on all sides. So this would normally be our fifth card. Sorry, I almost forgot to burn. Okay, now I'll rearrange these here in a second. So you've got the mystery here. You've got Jack, Queen, King. So now you can at least make people think that you have the potential of a straight. You've got the three, the nine, and the five. Nothing really going here. You need a pretty high probability for hearts to potentially come out. And even then, that's just not a lot. You've got a you've got two more cards potentially. So you four in the six, you need to make a straight. Not super great. But hey, over here, you've now got two pair. So we at least have that eighth ranked. And then over here, what do we get? Two, four, six. Okay, cool. So what are you gonna do here? Uh, I'll have this person bet. They'll bet 10 for a total of 25. Uh, like that's too much for me. The odds that I'm gonna get something are pretty low. Uh, you with your two pair, not bad. Let's say you decide that you are actually going to go and raise. So you'll add in 10 and then add 10 more. So this is once again where we talk about equity. So there's a total of 35 here. Hmm. Let me think here. Hmm. They'll stay in. Why not? But they have to put in 20 just to stay in. So notice that the value of hands increase as you go along. So that's 35. And what am I going to do over here? Mm, yeah, I'll stay in. Why not? You got two more cards. What, what's the worst that could happen? What's the best that could happen? That is part of this game is that included mystery. So we're going to burn another card. Notice how much more the deck is getting used compared to last time. Pair of kings. An ace, not really any help aside from that possible flush. And now there. Hmm. Now really, what do you want to do? They'll put in another you got the possibility of a flush here, which automatically brings you to that fifth rank. So you're gonna put in another 10. And then this person, let's see, let's really think here. Mm. Yeah, I'll go in here. This last card I promise you is probably going to be pretty defining because I can tell you from my end, all three of these could potentially win, depending on what this last card is. Ace, a two. And an ace. Hmm. Now is decision time. 
what do you want to do? Uh, this person here, I promise you, would have probably had nothing. So it's probably good because now look how much is in play just between everybody. So now I'm going to go and organize these cards here just for... So we now know that the flush is out. They've got two pair, the highest pair being that of queens. Close to a flush, that would have been good. Um, let's see, ace. They've got a pair of twos, they got a four and a six. So the odds of them having a flush are nil. And from our end, actually kind of worked out, they got increasing amounts. So remember we talked about the highest ranking hand goes, that'd be here. They're going to put down, they think their odds are pretty good. And they want to make you think their odds are pretty good. So they're going to do, since that ante was 10, they're going to put down 20 more. Now this person has to think they've got two pair. They don't have a full house, so they know what they've got. Is there a three of a kind? Did they want to lose more? They're going to say, nah, I got two pair. I've got a pretty decent ranking hand. It's possible. This person, they're going to fold. And I'll go ahead and show you what they had. They had two pair. Fours and twos. So this is kind of the relevant part. They didn't have a flush in any way. So two pairs, not bad, but considering you know the odds here, if they've got any other pair, they're beating your pair because they've got a king high pair. There was a queen high pair exposed here. So they know, nah, it's time to get out. So now we've achieved, once again, that equity. So now we do showdown. This person reveals that they had a pair of queens, pairs of threes. They have a pair of kings open and a pair of sevens. Now, if that had been the only pair, they would have lost. But however, on the reveal, two pairs, not a bad hand. This would be, as the cool kids would say, a bad beat. But that is one of the ways that you can learn in hand rankings, what you have, what you don't have, because queens and threes is pretty good hand. It's a pretty decent probability hand that it's going to win. It's just that once you get towards higher ranked hands, they're lower probability. That's the mystery of this game. Dealing with increasing orders of mystery, increasingly odds of who knows, and going from there. But that that's our first half. We're going to rearrange this, and next time I will be uh, changing up the way we do things and adding some fun community cards. So that way, we can still keep seeing exactly what's going down. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to join us next time as we are going into some more poker games and teach there's so many little variations on a theme, and we are going to see just how complicated two cards can get when it actually turns into seven. I'll see you next time.